amen and amen. And I'm not sure what all's behind the setting of Psalms chapter 12. And David, of course, he was much on the run from Saul a lot. And of course, his, because of his sin, he had to pay for it the rest of his days uh, in, in one respect with Absalom. Absalom, his son in rebellion, and whether it was that or his running from Saul or even in Saul's court and troubled, David's writing Psalms chapter number 12. And he starts out in verse 1 with the supplications. And, and David did a lot of praying, I'm telling you, after he got saved. And of course, his penalty, the penitent psalm of Psalm 51 with his acknowledging of his sin and his sins, his sin of adultery and sin of murder. And, of course, David confessed and got cleansing from the Lord. And here he's calling out to the Lord, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one, with his neighbor, with flattering lips, and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Who hath said, With our tongue will we prevail? Our lips are our own, who is Lord over us. For the oppression of the poor, for the sign of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. And really what we have embodied in Psalms 12, we have the preservation of the scriptures. All right here in verse 6 and verse 7. And if that's all we had, that would be enough to know that this is the right book, the King James Bible. Amen. And if I didn't even have that, I agree with what somebody I read after this week. If I didn't even have these verses to confirm the preservation of the scriptures, and we have more over and over and over, but what God's instilled in my heart in regeneration and his redemptive work is enough to me to take confidence and faith in this blessed old book. And that may be kind of a crude way of saying it, but God has given us enough of his word to, to assure us that we hold in our possession the right Bible, the book, the blessed word of God. But then, not only does he reveal the preservation of the scriptures, but he reveals the pervertedness of the so-called virgins. Right here in verse 8, the, the word perverse or perverted comes from the word wicked. And he said, the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. And I'm, I'm thinking, I'm getting a flashback from the past when I read Psalms chapter 12. In this day, this society that we're living in. And who would ever thought that we'd come to such a time that we're living in. Oh, when men, I tell you, despise the truth of the Word of God. We read about those apostates in the book of Second Peter 2 and in the book of Jude and First John 4. And of course, Paul, he didn't, he didn't spare them no time. No, he didn't spare. Oh, he didn't. He didn't. Uh, I tell you, he didn't fool around about those that were bringing heresy and, and, and coming down and despising the truth of the Word of God. But the wicked seem like on every side, everywhere you go, the wicked is. And, and that's through the, the work of Satan. And men are 
being uplifted and exalted and put on a pedestal and the Lord's been put plumb out of the picture. But anyway, we're seeing here, as I look down at these verses, just for a starting place today, we see the saints' devotion. David is crying out to the Lord, help Lord. And whatever he's been confronted with, we're not really sure, as I've done, elaborated just a little bit on this, whatever David was going through with had caused him to call upon the Lord. And oh, if there's ever a time that God's people got serious about calling upon the Lord. All them old saints of yesteryear, I remember my uncle, and he lived on the other side of our farm, and it was just continually. You'd go up upon the hillside near his barn, and you'd hear him back in there praying, calling on the Lord. It was told about Brother Onley Jones from over at Robbinsville, that dear preacher that's preached here before. And I have a friend that stayed over there a lot. And he said, I'd get up early in the morning, and I hear this noise up on the hill, Brother Onley up there praying, calling out to the Lord. And I was listening to the Faith Baptist camp this week, and uh, this one gentleman telling about Brother Sammy Allen. I said they'd be driving down the road, and uh, Brother, Aunt, Brother Sammy Allen pull over the side of the road, wherever there's at, and get out on his knees and start praying. Oh, I tell you, it's a shame that we, we call ourselves saved, and a lot of times we don't devote ourselves to prayer. But here's David. He got caught up in the troubles and, and the trials and all the things that was going on around him, and he calls upon the Lord. Help, Lord. And here's some of it right here. For the godly man ceases. And every time one of them dear old saints goes out of here, and ain't many of them left, I'm telling you, and prayer warriors and people that love the King James Bible, preaching and teaching, spirit filled me, not many of them left. But oh, no doubt David had some of this in mind. For the godly man ceases. And he said, The faithful fell from among the children of of men. And I've elaborated some along now as we've been studying. The saints' devotion, those that call on the Lord and consider the godly and the conscience of those that are faithful. Oh, we can reminisce a little bit on this day and see how this church has come up through the years with godly, faithful people, all that prayed and spirit-filled people and people that would sanction the truth of of the blessed word of God. And then we see the society's degeneration. All oh, he said in verse 2, they speak vanity every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. And he said, the Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. And all oh, what a day. A society that we're living in. A society that's degenerated. That's going down, down, down. All the sin and, and the Satan and all that self's got to push up in these days. It does have an effect on God's people. I was studying earlier this week and thinking about all that Paul had to go through with. All this awful, the awful sin and morality that was going on with the church situated there in Corinth and just to pass the well in what, 50 miles west of Athens, Greece is Corinth, Greece and you cross the Corinth Canal and, and go right into the city, city and where once the old church was situated but on the top of that mountain there was a building and all that uh, sex was a religion in Corinth and Paul's day had to contend with all that immorality and Paul stood faithful. Amen. Oh, here but here we see the society in degeneration. Oh, them that speak in vanity and flattering lips and a double heart they do speak. And then we not only see the society's degeneration, but we see Satan's deception. Oh, everywhere you turn, Satan is deceiving. His age-old plan uh, to misguide and misrepresent 
the truth of this blessed word of God I'm preaching from today. But here's the sovereign's dealings. Oh, it said the Lord shall cut off all the flattering lips. And on down in verse 5, he will arise and he said, I'll set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. God's dealing with his children and he'll get us through this awful old sojourn we're in this morning with all the troubles on every side and temptations and the trials and the besettings. The Lord, he's dealing with us. Oh, he, he's looking over, but on the same token, he's going to deal with the wicked. Amen. And then there's the scripture's durability that I've been reading and trying to focus on in verse 6 and verse 7. When he said, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And so we've been looking down at several things. I have eight of them that, to be exact, that identify a corrupt perversion. And that's speaking in totality of all the so-called virgins. Those that have and those that will be written that have come down the way. And here we talked about it in our last lesson. How that first of all we identify a corrupt version because it demotes God himself. Bringing God down to the level of man. And we see that in Romans. Well, I mentioned Romans chapter 1. When they change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like four-footed beast and creeping thing. And the list goes on. Oh, I tell you, we live in a religious day. Oh, everybody's got religion. So everybody's got some kind of a little God, we call it, that they're following. It. Oh, but not too many people exalting and esteeming the God of glory. But in Romans 1, and their stages down to a complete apostate, when they knew God, they glorified Him, not as God. And then I said, all, all these versions, we identify them not only because they demote God Himself, bring God down to the level of man, but they devalue, devalue Christ, the Son. Oh, this is a day when, I tell you, a lot of folk in religion have got away from the King James Bible and they don't realize how bad it is. But I've been been trying to study and prepare these lessons and bring some of this to our heart to see just how bad some of this stuff is really has gotten. Oh, we, we talked about the blood of the Lord Jesus left out of a Colossian. Just one instant. Colossians 1, 13, 14. They leave out the blood of Christ. That's devaluing Christ's work that he done upon the old rugged cross. And of course the Roman Catholics have come along with their abominable mass and, and I tell you, abomination in the sight of God. But anyway, we're seeing they devalue Christ, his worth, his work, and his will. And our Lord Jesus, I tell you, he's worthy. He's worthy of all praise and all adoration and all glory. But not, not so in a lot of places, our religious circles, and I'm calling, talking in the general realm of church circle, oh, a lot of places, they're upholding some personality down here. And oh, they've just pushed the Lord aside, grieved the Holy Ghost of God, and God won't stay around. And a lot of them, they ought to have Inkabod wrote on the door, which says His glory has departed. And every version demoting God and devaluing Christ. And then they despise the Spirit. Oh, the Spirit of God. The sweet Holy Spirit. I must say on this eve, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real mess in this pulpit. I'm a mess in doing anything for the Lord without the Holy Ghost of God. And a lot of churches have got to the place where they can get along with their formalities and their programs and, and all they can muster up from the flesh, they can get along and carry on their little service, they call it, 
and their sermonettes and their songettes and their preacherettes and, and their programettes, all that junk. But oh, I tell you, the Spirit of God, He's the only one can do for us which we cannot do for ourselves. But many of these verses, they've set the Spirit of God aside. They've grieved Him, and I tell you, pushed Him away, and God ain't around. Oh, I tell you, that's sad and dark. A church to call itself a church and not welcome the Holy Spirit of God. And He's here this morning. He's in everybody that's saved. But a lot of times, He's not controlling us. Oh, the fullness of the Spirit. I heard them preaching at the camp this week. And I heard several messages on the fullness of God. The fullness of the Spirit of God. And we're saved and we're sealed. We're going to heaven. The same Spirit that saved us, sealed us. But I'm afraid sometimes we're not filled with that Spirit. We're not allowing the Spirit of God to have control over us. And I'm afraid that's where a lot of folk are flirting with these other versions. Oh, I tell you, they're saved. But oh, they've soared way, way down the way from being filled with the Spirit. And they give in to anything that comes along. But despising the Spirit of God. And we study that in Hebrews chapter 10. Doing despite to the Spirit of God. Abusing the Holy Spirit of God. He's the one that wrote this Bible. Well, we talk about these, these authors like Paul and John and many of these down through the Scripture that pin down the Bible. But the Holy Ghost... Oh, I tell you, he's the one that brought this scripture to If we know anything about the Bible, the Holy Ghost has been doing the teaching. You see, it's been given by inspiration. That means it's God breathed. But with that, it's been given by revelation. God's revealed it. God's made it known by the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I need to turn, and we're just, I'm just trying to to wind up these lessons as the Lord has laid this upon my heart. But over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we'll just take the time and look down here. Hope you can thumb over there and look down at these verses. And we're seeing how this, this Bible that we have holding in our possession, this King James Bible, has come to us by revelation. And a lot of folk, they don't want to hear what God has to say. They want some man made something that somebody's put their nasty hands upon. But here, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ye heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now a lot of folk will stop right there and they miss the whole whole picture of what Paul said. But in verse 10, but God hath revealed. That means he's made known. That means he's given us an understanding. Oh, I so thank God on this day that many, many years ago, I got out of some of these places where they was uh, one, they believed that you could be saved one day and lost the next. I got out of these places where they didn't believe in the premillennial coming of our Lord Jesus. I got out of these places that downplayed doctrinal truth and got in this church and got my heart settled. And I'm still learning, even on this day, still grasping the understanding of the blessed Word of God. But Paul said, He hath revealed them unto us. He's talking about those things which God has prepared for them that love Him. Oh, you just you won't casually get in on this by the understanding. It won't be easy. No, I'm first to admit on this. It's been hard for this flesh to take the time and spend hours and hours and to God be all the glory to bathe and breathe over this book and God give me understanding. I don't want some what somebody else has wrote down. And I, I use commentaries and all that I can get that I know that's, that's sound. And I come, sometimes I get caught up in some of this stuff that ain't sound, and I push it aside. But thank God for the Spirit of God that's been teaching my heart. And that's what he's going to say here. But God hath revealed them unto us. How? By His Spirit. 
All this spirit that's despised in this, that people despising this King James Bible is despising. They're abusing the Holy Spirit of God because he wrote and he gives understanding to the truth of the Word of God. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given unto us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy, here it is, which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And a lot of folk, they just bunch up the scripture, and that's where we get perversion. Oh, they twist, and they twirt, and they, and they turn, the word, turn, turn from the Word of God. All these perverts, they twist the scripture and they build their own doctrine, their own teaching, their own theory, and go plumb way out on left field. But all oh, the Spirit, He'll teach you to compare scripture with scripture. And no scripture stands alone. I tell you, Peter wrote in Second Peter 1, and in those verses in 19 through 21, uh, and and Peter said, "We've got a sure more word. We've got a more sure word of prophecy, wherein too you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place." And he said, "No prophecy is of any private interpret. It's not by one man's interpretation. God's give us enough to go around to compare the script and think about it." All reading down the pages, this by how it all comes harmonizes together from men of all different walks of life and different time periods, writing in a perfect harmony that will give us the inspired word of God. But notice verse 14, I'm not going to leave it out. But the natural man receiveth not the natural man, that's the unregenerated man that does not have the Spirit of God. And I'm afraid that's where a lot of folk fit. I'm, I'm afraid that's just exactly where a lot of folk that are flirting and, and biting off anything that comes along except the King James. They're, they're not spiritually tall. They don't have the Spirit of God. But he said, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can they know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Oh, I'm telling you, on this day, we see the identity of these corruptions and their corruptors. They demote God, they devalue Christ, they despise the Spirit, and I said they deny sin. Oh, I tell you, sin ain't sin no more to a lot of old. But sin still nasty and wicked and vile. And God, I tell you, God ain't changed. No, the, an unchangeable God sits in his place on this day. He's not compromised. He's not condoning with sin. Sin's still black. And sin always ends up in a payday. The wages of sin is death. And the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see they deny sin. Oh, the corruptors. Oh, I can just pick out two on this day from the past. Westcott and Hort. If you, if you ever hear those names, these were corruptors. All oh, these that were instrumental, and they wasn't nothing but a bunch of wicked sinners. And filthy and vile as they could be, along with a, with a lesbian that were in some of the councils of writing some of these so-called... That's why we ought to throw it all out, because where it came from. But anyway, we're seeing they don't see nothing wrong with, with sin. Many of them corruptors didn't. Oh, I know these men that wrote this King James Bible. I know they were like a, they were not inspired themselves. They were, they were holy men moved on by the Holy Ghost of God, but they were not sinless. 
No, absolutely. They all had failures like we are. But the thing is, when they wrote this Bible, they were moved on with the third person of the Trinity of God, the Holy Ghost of God. Oh, that's why we know it's right. And then they def deify sinful men. They exalt men. Oh, that's what men's wanting in these days. This is a society. Oh, they're starving to feed their ego. They're wanting to be put on a pestle and be, be praised. And that's what a lot of these charlatans on TV, and I tell you, that's living their big lives, they want to be exalted and put up on, on, on a praise list and have all the riches of this world that they can grasp. But oh, here's our Lord Jesus. I'm telling you, that's the central person of this book I'm preaching from on this day. He's on every page in this King James Bible. But you couldn't say that at all in a perversion. No taking out his blood, doing away with his deity, downplaying his incarnation, and on the list could go. But they deify sinful men. Make a God out of of their own choosing. That's what a lot of folk are doing. And then they desecrate the scriptures. The sacred word of the living God. And I tell you we could spend hours and hours. And weeks after week exposing. Oh how they twist. And how they desecrate the word. The pure word of God. And I, I tell you every one of them is the same. And these so called. They delude the saints. All oh, every perversion. Oh, they delude this everybody, I tell you, it's affected some way. Oh, in a lot of churches, I tell you, uh, modern churches that have jumped the King James Bible, somebody's sitting in them churches, and they're, they're getting done, they're being harmed. Oh, with those that have come along to try to convince them that, the King, that their versions are just in line with the King James Bible. I had a lady this week. And I won't call her name, won't tell you where she's from. But anyway, it came on the Facebook. And she didn't, she didn't like any, she wanted to teach me where the King James Bible come from. She wanted to convince me that the King James Bible come from the perversions. So we could have a better understanding of the word. If, if I understood what she wrote, that's what I think she wrote. And that's a hogwash. No, no, this didn't come from a perversion. This is the infallible word of the living God. And it's upon God's promise. He made a promise that he would keep his word. And my text plainly said from this generation forever. Amen. From this generation forever. And all oh, God's been handing down his word. Oh, when we started many of our lessons of, of way back now. From Hebrews chapter 1. I said this word. I tell you just come along. In a, in, a, in a progressive manner. God didn't give it all at one time. And by the way. He didn't give it all. That he knows. But he give us enough. And we'll not, able, we'll not be able. In our finite mind. And while we're here. In this world. To grasp all that God has to say. But oh I want to be, be, be striving. To know more about the blessed word of God. And then they damn sinners. Oh, I have no use for a perversion. Not whatsoever. Not one ounce. Because of the damnation. All oh, that they, they do. To damn sinners from hell. And that's the devil's tool. To use a perversion. A non-inspired so-called Bible. A corruption. Oh, that's the devil's tool. To corrupt the hearts of men and keep them lost. And I close with this verse. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. Paul said, if our gospel be hid. It is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world, that's Satan. Hath blinded the minds of them that believe not less. The light of the glorious gospel. Which is an image of God. Should shine unto them. And the devil, he's smart. He's not all-knowing. No, no, I ain't going to give him that credit. But he is smart enough to know that this gospel that we preach is a light of the glorious gospel. It's the image of God. And all, all he can do to trick and to tangle and keep people 
away from the truth of the word of God, he'll do to damn their soul in hell. John chapter 10, the Lord said, I'm come, I, I'm the good shepherd, I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But he said, the thief, the thief, that's the devil, hath come to destroy and all he has to destroy the souls of men, women, boys, and girls. But thank God for this King James Bible, all rooted and grounded in all the foundation of our faith, stand strong in a day of great apostasy. All this Bible has stood the test. It's been through the fire and through all kinds of, of different things of people despising the Word of God, but it stands true on this day. Father, we come to thank you for the precious, infallible Word of God. And I pray, Lord, today you'll help us. Lord, I just...